Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We come now in our ongoing series that we call Sin Stones to the Sixth Commandment, which reads, Thou shalt not murder. This commandment is at one at the same time probably the most straightforward, the most obvious, the most uh, clear and straightforward of all of the Ten Commandments. Uh, And yet, that does not, at the end of the day, make it completely and absolutely simple. I think this is a really good time to remember a point uh, that I stressed earlier in this series about the context in which these Ten Commandments are given. Uh, In our day of uh, the culture wars, uh, as the church is losing or has lost Uh, its position of sort of informal privilege uh, here in the United States and the hostility against everything Christian and biblical uh, is increasing. One of the ways that those uh, battles have taken place has been uh, on something uh, as simple as the the posting of the Ten Commandments. Time was these were in every classroom in the United States. Uh, Now we're at the place where they can't even be placed anywhere on government-owned property. Well, that might give us the inclination to think, well, gosh, uh, God gave the law and these silly heathens don't want to hear it when God gave it to them so they'll know what to do. Well, it's certainly the case uh, that the heathen are called to submit to the Ten Commandments. Uh, Understanding context will remind us that it was actually given to God's covenant people. It is as if God came to earth and spoke to the church and gave the church these Ten Commandments. Again, doesn't mean that the unbeliever is not required to follow it, but that the purpose was to instruct and to guide God's own people in the context of to where they were headed, which was a land flowing with milk and honey. What, What I'm trying to get you to see is, again, to remember that God has rescued his people. He's carrying them on eagle's wings. He covenants with them. He's going to take them into this promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. He's going to drive out all the inhabitants. This is as close as you can get to reestablishing the blessing of the Garden of Eden. God will be with them. They will be God's special people. And there they'll be in this wonderful Edenic land. And God says, now when you get there, be sure not to kill each other. That should shock us. That should stop us in our tracks. God has to tell God's people who he's about to put in a place of extreme blessing. Now, when you get there, don't kill each other. Because as close as we may be able to get on this side of eternity to the blessings that were present in the Garden of Eden, we're not going to get into a place where there is no sin nature. We're still sinners. God has to tell us, don't do this. Because we're going to find ourselves tempted to do just this. Now, some clarity. There are some translations that will tell you, thou shalt not commit 
murders. Others will say, thou shalt not kill. And I've mentioned before uh, in our podcast the the silliness of the governor of Pennsylvania when I was a child who argued against capital punishment on the basis of this sixth commandment. The Bible says thou shalt not kill, so therefore we're not going to have the death penalty. Well, that's an abysmal ignorance of what the Bible says and teaches because the Bible is chock full of places where God first gives freedom for harming others, and second, where he actually commands it, including the clearing out of the promised land. Now, God does not speak with a forked tongue. When God said, thou shalt not kill, and then they get to the promised land, God says, now go in there and kill them all. Nobody had to say, wait a minute, Lord. You said not to kill. Or when God gave the rest of the law, and the law says, if you do this, you should be put to death. No one said, wait a minute. How can we put somebody to death when we're told not to kill? The context is abundantly clear that what is forbidden here is murder, unauthorized. And I would go beyond that because we recognize even in the English language that there are different kinds, different levels of homicide. So I want to narrow this, I want us to recognize rather, and this is not me doing it, I want us to recognize that this command is narrower than simply saying, under no circumstances should one human take the life of another. It's not saying that. But it is most certainly broader than simply saying, thou shalt not commit first degree murder. Well, what what are these distinctions that we make between first-degree murder and other forms of homicide? Well, uh, one of the defining qualities of first-degree murder is that it comes with malice aforethought. That's legal language that says not only do you uh, have to have the mens rea, that is the criminal mind, not only do you have to uh, intend to do evil, you have to intend to, to kill. You have to plan in advance. It has to be premeditated. It's not just, ooh, I'm so mad right now, I'm going to kill you. That could be second-degree murder, which is really close to voluntary manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter is what happens when you kill someone doing something to them that doesn't necessarily mean that that's your intent, but you should have known this was a possible thing that could have happened. If I cut your uh, brake line, because I think it would be helpful to teach you a lesson for you to wreck your car, and you end up dying in that car wreck, that's voluntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter is another form of homicide where I'm responsible, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't mean anything wrong. I just was careless. If I'm looking down at my phone and not looking at the road in front of me and I run into you as you're crossing the street, that's involuntary manslaughter. So we have all these different kinds of ways of killing uh, that this commandment forbids. But as we will see next time when we come back to the sixth commandment in our series, The Sin Stones, and as we look at Jesus speaking at the Sermon on the Mount, one can also violate the sixth commandment where no one ends up dead. I've confessed before that there's precious little Hebrew that I know. Now, there are many people who have served in as pastors uh, who are in the same boat, uh, but they didn't get there in the same way I got there. Many pastors in the same boat went to seminary, and in the context that they were in seminary, they studied Hebrew and learned some Hebrew and then forgot it. I, on the other hand, never learned it. The few Hebrew words that I know are words that I picked up along the way and stuck with me for some reason. And today, as we consider and continue our series that we call Proper Theology, uh, looking at the character and attributes of God, we're going to uh, bring to mind one of those Hebrew terms. 
that I learned somewhere along the way. I, I believe I learned it uh, when I was in graduate school uh, studying English at the University of Mississippi, but not at the school. I think I learned it from a friend who asked me about some song that they used to sing in church camp. That song was called Jehovah Jireh. And I had heard Jehovah, of course. I was familiar with that word. But what is this Jireh? What is Jehovah Jireh? And my friend told me, oh, Jehovah Jireh was uh, one of the names that the children of Israel used in describing God. And it means God, Jehovah, God, my provider. God, my provider. And that just stuck with me. One of the things that we've wrestled with in this series from beginning to this point uh, is a struggle between uh, looking at God in abstract terms and looking at him in more concrete terms. If you remember when we covered the omnipotence of God, uh, I talked about the distinction between uh, affirming that God is omnipotent and affirming that God has a strong right arm, that these are not actually perfect synonyms, that what omnipotence describes is, as I put it, a score on a potency meter. It's it's a score of infinity, yes, but it's a score on a potency meter. And it says nothing whatsoever about the direction or the purpose or the uses of that infinite power. God has a strong right arm, on the other hand, communicates not only that strength, but that that strength is harnessed for our well-being and for our protection. Well, God, our provider, does much the same thing. It takes the idea that God is the source of all things and moves it into a relational context. Have you ever read through the Psalms and, and seen how often in the Psalms the psalmist praises God for his faithfulness in caring for the animals. Jesus does the same thing when he talks about uh, not fretting and not worrying and how our lives are worth so much more than sparrows, but that God provides, God provides, God provides. He provides for this one, he provides for that one. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Now friends, when we say that, we're, we are communicating a truth about God's kindness. We're making sure people understand that just because something went well for you, it doesn't mean you have God's favor. That's a good lesson to learn. But it's also vital that we learn that God has the kind of heart that delights to provide rain for the unjust as well as for the just. God, my provider, gives us a glimpse, not just into the strength of the right arm of God, but it gives us a glimpse into the tenderness of the heart of God. He provides. Now, when you see that tender heart, it can have an impact on us, one, it can make us more generous. But even before that, it should make us less grumbling, less complaining. When I look at what I have and I realize that everything I have, I have because God gave it to me. And everything I don't have, I don't have because God didn't give it to me. It pushes me in the direction of remembering what I'm owed and therefore causing me to give thanks, to praise God, to sing of the glories of Jehovah Jireh. When I look at what I have as 
Oh, the result of our political or economic structures, or the result of just random forces that uh, divide up wealth. And not only, not only am I driven to grumble and complain, but I've lost the blessing of having someone to thank. When we reject God, it's not simply that we make him mad and now he's after us. When we reject God, we lose our capacity to be grateful. And gratitude, friends, is its own reward. It's not something that happens to us. It's something we're called to. If you're alive, if you're listening to this, even if you are not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have reason to praise God and to thank him. In fact, in Romans 1, where Paul is zealous to try to communicate the universality of our sin, of our fallen nature, and describing what's wrong with us prior to God remaking us, He says that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We don't acknowledge God. And then he says, neither were they grateful. It is a primordial sin, a root sin, a sin from which other sins spring forth in abundance. So let us learn, even inside the church, let us learn to praise God to sing of the glory of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider, who cares for me, for my lovely wife, for my children. He cares for us and meets our needs to the praise of his everlasting glory. I'm not good at it. But I liked it when it was good to me. That is, for both my teen years and much of my adult life, like many men, I took responsibility for caring for the lawn, which meant cutting grass. And this image of myself riding along, nice hat on, steering this way and that way, being wise and judicious about where to go and where not to go, and where to spit the cut grass, where not to spit the cut grass. Oh, that's a wonderful thought. But what used to drive me crazy is when something would go wrong. A tire might go flat. More likely, a belt might break. Something would go wrong, and I found myself stuck because I don't know how to fix things. I'm not comfortable with that. Well, often the same thing is true here. I'm quite comfortable uh, recording these podcasts. There are people who uh, struggle with public speaking. There are people who are good at public speaking who struggle at speaking when there's no one there to hear. Not me. Don't have a problem with that. I'm comfortable with that. But all of the everything else that goes into it, getting the right software, opening and closing the right software, getting the right levels, everything other than me talking is to me like when the lawnmower breaks down. In fact, today, uh, as I was recording something else earlier in the day, uh, I attempted to make a video uh, three different times, and each time we had failure. It's frustrating to me. I remember when the Jesus Changes Everything reboot started out almost a year ago, and for weeks we had this knocking sound. This Every time I uh, finished a word, it sounded like I was going ch-ch-ch. 
And uh, I had no idea how to fix it, but eventually it got fixed. And I have had, gratefully, a lot of help along the way. I had one dear friend, uh, Charles Hacker, ironic name for a guy who works on the internet, Charles Hacker, who helped me put together the uh, rcsprojr.com. I had another friend, Christopher Mann, who helped me set up all manner of things for this podcast. And uh, today I've got uh, received help, as often is the case, from David Knight, uh, who helps in various and sundry ways along the way. But still, it's just me today, sitting here in my office with all this equipment, hoping it will all work. Now, I mention all this to tell you, uh, uh, well, to ask if you would be willing to come alongside as well. We have partners. We have people who've committed to support our work every month, and we're so grateful to them, each and every one of them. We could use more. Uh, we could use more to enable me to actually devote my time uh, to the work that we're trying to do here and not have to invest so much time and energy in outside work to put food on the table. Uh, we would love to have the finances to have uh, even more up-to-date, uh, uh, better equipment. Uh, I'm recording this on a uh, laptop that is uh, approaching eight years old. Uh, and I'm doing it without uh, uh, paid technical help. Uh, so there's all sorts of things. And, of course, we want to grow. One of the ways that we grow is uh, by investing uh, donor money uh, to reach more people. Um, but that's also another way, again, without money, that you can be a help to us. We're looking for partners. If you uh, love what you're hearing, but you're not uh, in a position financially, I know these are hard times uh, to come alongside us, you can certainly tell your friends. You can go on the internet and say, here's a really good podcast that I've been enjoying. Uh, you got to take a listen. You can go to those places where you can write reviews for these things. There's all sorts of things that you can do to be a partner, to come alongside. You can send us an encouraging word. Those are always welcome and grateful. There's not any limit to the number of ways that you can be supportive of the work that we're trying to do here. And as more and more of you do so, it's my hope and my prayer that the work that we do here will not only reach more people, uh, but will improve, that our sound will get better, that my editing will get better, that our software will get better, and everything else that goes into uh, creating the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, everything that goes into the Ask RCs that we put up on YouTube every day, everything that goes into the blog pieces that we put up every day. Uh, friends, we are creating content and we have hopes and dreams for more content uh, in the future. One of the things that I'm considering uh, is putting together an online course on uh, sermon preparation. Uh, it's something I have experience with that some people might feel a little bit uncomfortable or lack some confidence. And I think it could be a help to people. But I don't even have one of those little rings that they that they make uh, to make your face look well when you're making homemade YouTube videos. So those are the kind of things that I've got bubbling inside me. I'm a I'm a content creator. I can make lots of it, uh, you know, it, but marketing, not so much. Technology, not so much. Uh, business acumen, not so much. These are not my strengths. But, you know, God provides people to help where we have our weaknesses. You may have all those skills that I don't have and not have content. Let's work together. You may have some of those skills. You may not have any of those skills, but you may have uh, a vision that, that, that is consistent with our vision and have the finances uh, to come alongside. There's all sorts of ways that we can encourage each other, that we can work together. I'm asking you to consider those ways, to take the time and think it through. What can I do to be a part of Jesus changing everything through supporting the work of Dunamis Fellowship and the podcast of Jesus Changes Everything. 
Is this some place where I can be uh, active in fulfilling the mission that Jesus has given to me? Bring that to the Lord in prayer, and please let us know what you think. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.